Hi, 8th grade. This is our lecture presentation PowerPoint on Chapter 16, Lesson 2 for American History. This is Lesson 2 entitled Challenges to Slavery. So, uh, so that we can go ahead and keep this video relatively short, I'm going to go ahead and actually send all of you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation um, through, your, uh, through Classcraft. And like that, we can keep this video relatively short, uh, but I do want you to listen to the notes. I do offer a lot of notes um, verbally through, uh, through, through communication, so please ensure that you pay attention to this video, take screenshots, take notes, and as always, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to ask me. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the lesson. This is Lesson 2, Challenges to Slavery. So you might have remembered that last lesson, uh, The Search for Compromise. Uh, we talked about a couple of things, okay? Last time we talked about how Democratic President Franklin Pierce uh, was elected in 1853 as the nation's 14th president. Uh, Pierce was adamant on enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act and was known to be a large proponent in the defense of slavery. Meanwhile, Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas uh, had proposed the idea of popular sovereignty, which gave new territories the right to decide if whether or not slavery would be legal in their land. Support from the South and President Pierce led to the enactment of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which eventually gave way to the banishment of the Missouri Compromise. Uh, the act caused a lot of turmoil, especially in Kansas, where abolitionist John Brown led an attack that killed five slavery supporters. And you guys watched a little documentary video on that event, which was called Bleeding Kansas. Uh, Bleeding Kansas, as it became to be known, became the first warning that a civil war could be on the horizon for America, especially heading in this direction. Now, before we go ahead and jump into the lesson, I want you to consider something. Uh, from your research on different third parties uh, that you guys did for me last week, you probably noticed how huge that list was of all the different third parties that have existed in America. Uh, consider this question. What effect do you think third parties have on the two major parties that exist, which right now are Republicans and Democrats, but you know uh, in the time period that we're talking about, it actually originally started as Democrats and the Whigs. Okay. Uh, one might argue that third parties draw votes away from the major parties and can actually occupy extra seats in Congress that the major parties then don't have access to. Uh, consider we talked about the Free Soil Party last lesson, uh, which was made up of former Democrats and Whigs, uh, and the Free, Soil, the Free Soil Party won a few seats in Congress. Democrats, as a result, lost representation, as did the Whigs, and both major parties also lost seats in Congress. So third parties do generally take votes, take representation away from the major parties. Uh, think about any third party candidates you may have seen in, uh, in the last two elections, uh, 2012 and 2016, um, and think about how much of an effect um, those parties had on the Republican and Democratic parties. Alright, so the birth of the Republican Party. Finally, uh, the Whigs are going to diminish. Um, this is the start of that diminishment, and we're going to see the rise of the Republican Party as we know it today. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which gave way to the repeal of the Missouri Compromise and left the decision of slavery in the hands of each territory's population, which we called popular sovereignty, that act caused a lot of debate within both the Democratic and Whig parties. Northern Democrats against slavery left the party over the issue. The Whig Party was also divided over the same controversial issues over slavery. This leads into the 1854 congressional elections. Anti-slavery Whigs and Democrats joined with Free Soilers to form their own brand new party titled the Republican Party. The Republican Party had one major goal, ban slavery in new territories. In 1854, the Republicans chose candidates to challenge the pro-slavery Whigs and Democrats in both state and congressional elections. The Republicans quickly gained popularity and strength in the North, where slavery was strongly opposed. In the congressional elections of 1854, they won control over the House of Representatives and several state governments, 
Unlike the Republicans, almost 75%, almost three-fourths of the Democratic candidates from free states lost in 1854. So the Republicans are really gaining an upper hand uh, in the congressional elections of 1854 and quickly became a very popular party, especially in the North where slavery was obviously a horrible idea. In contrast, the Republicans, of course, receiving a lot of support in the North where they don't like slavery, the Republicans are going to receive almost zero support from the South, which was largely made up of, who? Supporters for slavery. Simultaneously, Democrats having lost members from the North became basically a large Southern party. This divide would make itself much more apparent in the presidential election of 1856. So we now have Republicans occupying what is basically considered the North at the time and Democrats basically uh, making up the South. So the presidential election of 1856, uh, the Whig Party, which is still divided over the questions of slavery that we had posed before, uh, did not offer a presidential candidate in 1856. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, this was actually the start of the diminishment of the Whig Party. Eventually, um, the Whig Party will disintegrate and become just uh, part of the Republican Party uh, slash Democrat Party. The Republican Party chose John C. Fremont from California, a famed Western explorer, as their candidate for president. As a party, their platform called for free territories. Their slogan, free soil, free speech, and Fremont. The Democratic Party chose James Buchanan from Pennsylvania. Buchanan was known for being a diplomat and former member of Congress. He already was uh, very popular to a lot of the states, um, very well known. He appealed to the Southern white population by endorsing Stephen Douglas's idea of popular sovereignty. Then you have this third party that came up around this time and they called themselves the American Party and also they were called the Know Nothings. The American Party, aka the Know Nothings, grew quickly between 1853 and 1856 by attacking immigrants. They nominated former President Millard Fillmore as their candidate for president. The Know Nothings were still, however, divided over the issue of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and when they refused to call for a full repeal of the act, many Northern supporters left the party. So just a little uh, screenshot for you, just to wrap up pretty much uh, political parties that existed in the election of 1856. We have here five different candidates that existed. I'm sorry, five different parties. Um, those were the Democrats, the Whigs, the Free Soilers, the Republicans, and the Know Nothings. The vote in 1856 was divided along rigid sectional lines. Rigid is one of your vocabulary terms for this lesson, which means firm and inflexible. So the vote in 1856 was a very rigid vote, all depending on geographical position. Buchanan took all of the southern states except for Maryland. Fremont, on the other hand, won 11 out of the 16 free states, but did not get any electoral votes from south of the Mason-Dixon line, which is the border between Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware. We've talked about the Mason-Dixon line before uh, earlier in the school year. With 174 electoral votes compared to the 114 that Fremont earned and the mere eight that Fillmore earned, with 174 votes, James Buchanan won and became the 15th president of the United States. Here is the little uh, electoral map, electoral vote map. Uh, this is very significant considering that this is the first time that we see Democrat and Republican in our nation's history on an electoral vote map. Again, this is the first time the Republican Party um, makes an appearance. So it's significant to see that just in the short amount of time that they existed, as I mentioned before, they gained a lot of popularity in the North, but unfortunately, um, due to Buchanan's popularity and especially his popularity in, in the South, um, he ended up winning the, the majority of the electoral votes. You can see that the popular votes are much closer and you could even see that while Fillmore only had such a small percentage of the electoral votes, he actually almost earned a million votes in a popular vote. And you can see how that number 
would have made an incredible difference for either Fremont or Buchanan, raising again this very popular ongoing question as to how legitimate the electoral votes are when compared to uh, the numbers pr uh, produced by the popular votes. Uh, again, popular vote are the votes actually given by the people. These are the actual people's votes. And then electoral votes are votes actually made by each state's electors. Okay. So contract for the section, why did the Republican Party form? I'll give you a second to just go ahead and think about the answer that, to that question. The Republican Party formed because there was a sectional split in political parties over the issue of slavery. Moving on to Section 2, Dred Scott v. Sanford, infamous landmark Supreme Court case. We talked about it last year in civics. One of you actually, I think, had this uh, this uh, court case as your, uh, as your assigned project, um, so this might uh, ring some bells for you. So, for those of you who don't know, Dred Scott at the time was an enslaved African American who was bought by a doctor in Missouri. Uh, Missouri at the time was a slave state. In the 1830s, the doctor moved with Scott to Illinois, which was a free state at the time, and then later on to the Wisconsin Territory. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which was a product of the Articles of Confederation, the NWO banned slavery in those regions. Uh, later on, the doctor eventually returned with Scott to the slave state of Missouri. So in 1846, uh, several anti-slavery lawyers are going to help Scott sue for his freedom. Scott claimed that he should be free since he had lived temporarily in different areas where slavery was actually illegal. In 1857, his lawsuit, his case, reached the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. Uh, the issue at hand was Scott's status, but the scope for the court was much larger, as the case also gave that court the, uh, the opportunity to rule on the question of slavery itself. So the court eventually made a decision under the decision-making and jurisdiction of Chief Justice Roger B. Taney. It's not pronounced Taney, it's Taney. Roger B. Taney, who wrote the court's majority opinion. He said that Dred Scott was still an enslaved person, and as such, he was not a citizen and had no right to even bring a lawsuit to begin with. Living on free soil, Taney said, did not make Scott free. A slave was considered property, and the Fifth Amendment prohibited the taking of property without due process. Finally, he wrote that Congress had no power to ban slavery. The Missouri Compromise, which banned slavery north of the 3630 latitude line, was therefore unconstitutional, and so was the idea of popular sovereignty. Not even voters could ban slavery because it would mean taking someone else's property. In shortened terms, Taney used the Constitution to protect slavery and therefore said that the Constitution was written to protect the institution of slavery. Here's a little screenshot for you. I'm not going to go ahead and read through this. Just go ahead and take a little screenshot. This is a shortened form uh, of the Dred Scott v. Sanford case. Use this for your notes. Use it as a little cheat sheet. Here you have a picture of Dred Scott. So reactions to the decision. Obviously, the North is not going to be too happy that the Supreme Court went ahead and said such a thing. Uh, the Dred Scott landmark decision upheld what many white Southerners already had believed in, that nothing could legally stop slavery. It ruled limiting the spread of slavery, the Republicans' main issue, as unconstitutional. Republicans and other anti-slavery groups were outraged at this decision. They called the Dred Scott decision, quote-unquote, a wicked and false judgment and the greatest crime ever committed in the nation's courts. So this wraps up section two, comp check number two. Why did the Dred Scott decision say that voters could not ban slavery? The answer to that is that they ruled that it would be like taking someone's property without due process, which is unconstitutional. 
The Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case essentially ruled that slavery was constitutional and that a mere act of the voters or Congress, such as the Missouri Compromise, could not outlaw slavery. To outlaw slavery would take an amendment to the Constitution, which eventually is what's going to end slavery for our country, the passing of the 13th Amendment, which is going to happen much, much later. The 13th Amendment will get rid of slavery once and for all. Moving on to Section 3, Lincoln and Douglas. This is our last section for the lesson. Uh, the Illinois Senate race of 1858 was the center of national attention. Uh, as you know, senator at the time for Illinois was the very famous Stephen A. Douglas. Uh, the contest pitted uh, Douglas himself, uh, who coined, uh, you might remember him as coining the new definition of popular sovereignty as it applies to slavery. Uh, it went ahead and pinned Douglas up against a brand new rising star in the Republican Party, new individual out of the state of Illinois, none other than Mr. Abraham Lincoln himself. People considered Douglas a possible candidate for president in the 1860 election. Lincoln, who was less known outside of the state of Illinois, challenged Douglas to a series of debates to which Douglas agreed. This is exactly what you read about in the uh, primary source activity, if you've already completed it, which is based on the Lincoln-Douglas debates. The Lincoln-Douglas debates. Lincoln and Douglas debated a total of seven times over the course of three months in the year of 1858. Thousands of spectators came to watch the debates, and newspapers at the time provided wide coverage. The main topic, subject of discussion of the debates, was none other than slavery. During the debate at Freeport, Illinois, Lincoln asked Douglas in regards to his belief on popular sovereignty whether or not the people of a territory could legally exclude slavery before becoming a state. Douglas had to really think about his answer before he went ahead and replied that voters could exclude slavery by refusing to pass laws that protected the rights of slaveholders. His response, this response, became known as the Freeport Doctrine. Very important to take note of that. Uh, the response also satisfied some of, uh, anti, some of his anti-slavery followers, but it did, however, cost Douglas his support in the South. Douglas claimed that Doug, I'm sorry, Douglas claimed that Lincoln wanted African Americans to be fully equal to whites. Lincoln, however, denied this, but he still insisted that African Americans should at least be able to enjoy particular rights and freedoms. Lincoln is quoting, uh, Lincoln is quoted for, uh, for this famous quote from that debate. Uh, Lincoln says, but in the right to eat the bread, which his own hand earns, an African American is my equal, and the equal of Senator Douglas, and the equal of every living man. Following the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Douglas did win a narrow victory in the senatorial election, so Douglas won anyways, and Lincoln lost, but Lincoln did not come away empty-handed. As I mentioned before, Lincoln started off as somebody who was just known in the state of Illinois because of how much national attention these debates gathered. Uh, Lincoln walked away with a national reputation as a man of clear thinking who could argue with force and persuasion. This is going to help him big time when he runs for president um, in the next national election. So, screenshot here for the Lincoln-Douglas debates for you to take a screenshot of. John Brown and Harper's Ferry. After the 1858 senatorial election, Southerners felt threatened by Republicans. Then, an act of violence added to their fears. On October 16, 1859, abolitionist John Brown, you might remember him from the Bleeding Kansas event. Same John Brown. John Brown led a group on a raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, targeting a federal arsenal. An arsenal, vocab term, is a place to store weapons and military equipment. Brown hoped to arm enslaved African Americans and start a revolt against slaveholders. Abolitionists were the ones, actually, who had funded the raid. John Brown said in his statement to the Virginia court, Now if I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood with the blood of millions in this slave country, 
whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I submit, so let it be done. Local citizens and federal troops defeated Brown's raid, uh, tried and convicted in the Virginia Court of Law of treason and murder, Brown received a death sentence. On December 2nd, 1859, John Brown was executed by hanging. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. Very haunting to consider, especially since these were actually Brown's last words. This was, his found, this was actually found in his cell, uh, written on a note prior to his execution. And you can see that he's kind of predicting that civil war is the only thing that's going to solve um, the problems that America was facing at the time. Brown's death shook the North. Uh, some anti-slavery Northerners rejected Brown's use of violence, while most of the most of the rest of the population at the time, most of the rest of the anti-slavery population, saw him as a martyr. Uh, martyr, another vocab term, is a person who dies for a great cause. Brown's death rallied abolitionists. When white Southerners learned of Brown's abolitionist ties, their fears of a great Northern conspiracy against them were confirmed, thereby widening the gap between the North and the South. The nation was on the brink of disaster and war. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, if you have any questions about this lesson, feel free to go back through the rest of the video, ask me questions on Classcraft, hopefully uh, this covered a lot of the confusion that you may have had after uh, working on the primary source activity, wondering exactly what was the cause for these debates between Lincoln and Douglas. Um, again, uh, feel free to take notes, take screenshots on this video, watch it as many times as you need to. I will be sending you a copy of this PowerPoint um, because of the fact that you have an exam, so hopefully that'll help you out. So just a little reminder for you guys, uh, posting this here on Wednesday, April 15th. I don't know when you're going to be watching this video, uh, but I'm posting it today on the 15th. Uh, so just a reminder that the primary source activity uh, that I mentioned... Um, yeah, see, it's, well, I made a mistake. It says that it's due today, but it is actually due tomorrow. Sorry about that. Um, so the primary source activity is due by tomorrow. This should be Thursday, April 16th at 11.30 p.m. Thursday, April 16th at 11.30 p.m. The primary source activity is due. How do you find it? You go into the Remote Access Center, go into Chapter 16, Lesson 2, and submit it to the Assignment tab. Of course, you can find the attachment on the Task tab all the way at the bottom of the page. Now, the Chapter 16, Lesson 2 exam, which will be based on pretty much the entirety of this PowerPoint, is going to open up on Friday morning at 8 a.m., and it'll be due that same day at 11.30 p.m. You're going to be able to find it in that Remote Access Center um, on its own quest marker that I will be titling something along the lines of Chapter 16, Lesson 2, Exam. Okay, guys, again, thank you so much for watching. Feel free to go ahead and slap that like button at the bottom of the page. Hit subscribe to my channel. And as always, ask me any questions if you have any. God bless you all, and have a great day. Bye-bye.